Welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to the Future Money Podcast. My goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we're seeing in the field of crypto, and hopefully empower you with this information, and then let you make your own decision on what their impact can be on the future of money and the future of finance. To do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have a one-on-one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. Before I introduce my guest today, I really want to thank all of you listeners, the half a million of you who follow me across all my social media platforms, really for all the support for this podcast. Despite the fact that we launched only a couple of months ago, we already have over thousands of, of downloads on for each episode, over 100 countries. So really, really big thank you from that perspective. If you like the podcast, I'll really appreciate it if you give it a five-star rating as it would really help with discoverability and helping others discover uh, the podcast and learn more about the exciting world of crypto. Let's kick it off. Today, really, my guest is Mason Nystrom. He's a senior research analyst at Misari. One thing about uh, Mason that people often don't know is that before discovering crypto and getting into the crypto rabbit hole, he was a personal trader and a sport performance researcher in a kinesiology lab. So really, here we go. The, the, the diligence and the discipline of sports trading and high performance put into crypto. Mason, good to have you on the show today. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, very warm introduction, Henry. Great to be on. So Mason, before there's so many things I want to talk to you about, you know, we're going to talk about Web 3.0, the metaverse and go in detail in some of these developments. But I think it would be helpful for our audience if you can give a quick overview of your background and really what you do, I'm sorry, but also your background and how you enter the crypto space as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you kind of alluded to, I was in uh, sports performance, decided that that really wasn't the field that I wanted to be in long term. So I decided to go back and do my MBA. And while I was doing my MBA, I was decided that I was sick of school, just tired of, of kind of like the business classes. And so I really wanted to work. And uh, working in Hong Kong, I started joining a uh, interning at a crypto local cryptocurrency exchange called Gatecoin. And this was during the 2017 run up, immediately fell in love with crypto. And then even after the, the subsequent crash, I was still like, you know what, this is what I want to do. Uh, I want to commit a significant portion of my career to this. And uh, so I came back to the States, joined Consensus on their marketing team, did a lot of stuff from portfolio strategy to content marketing, really developed a passion for writing. And uh, that's what kind of led me to Masari, where I joined a little over a year and a half ago as their kind of first Web3 analyst. That's awesome. You know, a fun fact, actually, Gatecoin, where you start your crypto career, the founder of Gatecoin, Aurelien Menon, was really my first crypto buddy. I talk about it actually in my next book, but uh, when I discovered the crypto in 2013, I thought I was one of the few ones in Hong Kong. And I literally, I discovered the founder of Gatecoin. And uh, I, I remember I organized his first speaking event in, I think it was January or February 2014, at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong about crypto. And I remember, I will never forget, because people then complained to the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, saying, how come Henry is organizing this event about money launderers and drug dealers? I mean, that was still the reputation back in the day. So it's funny how you uh, you start your career with uh, with Aurelien. It's, it's uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, that's so funny. It comes uh, It comes full circle. <laughs> Exactly. Mason, can you also share with us, like, what are you doing at, at, at Messari? Like, kind of what's your focus? Obviously, you mentioned, you know, uh, Web3, but give us a type of like your average day at Messari. What does it consist of? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I cover Web3 and what falls into that is Web3 infrastructure, NFTs, social tokens, and kind of some of those other emerging trends. My day to day varies between uh, could spend it diving deep into a new protocol, could spend some of it doing some data analysis, data cleaning, trying to find insights amidst uh, the noise of information that's out there. Or I could spend uh, some time writing. Um, and I would say like the, the combination of those two things takes up the majority of my day. Oh, wow. Well, let's dive right in. Let's talk about like obviously Web 3.0, right? So obviously there's a lot of use cases that are being discussed right now for Web 3.0. Obviously Web 3 is a big topic right now, not only in the crypto circles, but in mass media as well. What is the use case you really expect to see uh, really come at the forefront or get the most traction when it comes from a Web 3 uh, angle? Yeah, it's interesting. Web 3 over the the past six months has kind of uh, become a, a more use term in crypto. And so where there is, whereas it used to be kind of just Web3 infrastructure, it's kind of evolved to encompass a lot of crypto. And so if you think of it from that stance, you're going to continue to see the proliferation of DeFi uh, payments. Uh, but from the more consumer aspect of Web3, which is kind of where I tend to cover uh, more so, I think we've already kind of seen the mainstream of NFTs. Uh, and that's going from everything to IP, to brands, to content, and uh, the, kind of the other, I would say, narrative that, that really took off towards the back half of the past 
year was gaming. And so we've seen uh, billions of dollars go into the gaming space from a, a venture uh, investment perspective. And uh, that's been a really interesting trend because it combines this uh, beloved industry with this kind of crypto primitive of NFTs. Absolutely. Actually, from a gaming perspective, do you think this will be kind of the billion dollar app in a way, right? The Where we really see the, the, the Web3 ecosystem being catalyzed. You think it'll be more at the, on the NFT side that will be catalyzed? It'll be, it'll be gaming. Where do you think will be the really the, the tipping point? Yeah, I think from the consumer side, both of those industries are, are going to take off. You're going to see uh, whether it's existing or crypto native brands build uh, multi-billion dollar companies within the gaming verticals. And, and so far, the, the types of games that we've seen really take off have been the, like the trading card games, because you can't really build anything too dynamic, uh, you know, built on a blockchain yet, or even like uh, using uh, those types of native assets. From the NFT side, we've seen kind of the, I mean, obviously the the broader adoption of avatar projects, people using it for whether it's their Twitter profile, kind of some sort of social identity, and then existing brands adopting that uh, trend as well and trying to integrate that uh, into their existing customer base and also trying to kind of uh, build to this new emerging customer base that is the crypto native users. You know, for a lot of these brands, I mean, obviously they're using as part of their marketing or as part of their outreach to their customers and existing customers as well, right? But who do you think will be the winners and losers? Uh, you, like, for example, the, in the gaming side, right? Do you think that traditional gaming players will be able to adapt to this Web3 ecosystem or uh, there'll be other kind of winners that will emerge and who can be the potential losers? That's a good question. I think the answer is going to be a mix. You're going to have some crypto native games that do incredibly well. And then you're going to have some existing companies, whether it's Ubisoft or uh, whoever it is in the traditional space that either acquires or finds a way to build semi-popular uh, crypto games, or at least games that adjacently are able to use digital assets that uh, players are able to own and trade. And so we've kind of seen a, an early wave of that in terms of like Axie Infinity has been arguably the most successful game to date. Uh, but it's still very early in terms of its game concepts. It's, it's a fairly simple game and it's nothing close to what you would consider a, a AAA rated game in Call of Duty or, uh, you know, it doesn't have also the, the mass adoption of something like Fortnite. Yeah, it's, it's a good comparison. I think even Axie Infinity, if you like, I think the user experience right now, forget even accessing some of these games, but you know, the, the user experience is still very clunky, uh, even a lot of these metaverse communities as well, right? So I think that we, hopefully we'll see some improvements on, on some of these over the next couple uh, months and years. Uh, one, one, one element on this, obviously, you know, a lot of our listeners are investors. There's a lot of actually institutional investors, people are looking at uh, getting exposure to the whole Web3 ecosystem. I mean, what do you think are the ways people can get exposure or, or what are you seeing in the market of how people are, are kind of getting, trying to get exposure to the space? And what, how do you think this is going to evolve over the next couple of months and years? So I guess uh, kind of first disclaimer, foremost, like nothing I say is investment advice. This is just kind of uh, what I see in the market. So if you look at Web3, you can kind of tackle it from the infrastructure side or the consumer side. And so the infrastructure side might be projects uh, that are tackling file storage. So that could be something like Filecoin, Arweave, Saya, or you might get into kind of the the what is needed for a mass stream application. Uh, and that could be something like LivePeer that provides video transcoding. And then from the kind of more consumer side, you get into not only the uh, individual NFTs that, that people can purchase, uh, but also the kind of the, the native assets of these platforms. And so that could be something like Sand from Sandbox, or if you look at what is going to uh, continue to grow in terms of like the next couple of years, is you're going to see the rapid financialization of all these assets. Because an NFT can be anything from a financial contract to uh, a piece of digital art, to a piece of IP content, you name it. And so as the financialization of that increases, you're going to see a lot of NFT market in infrastructure continue to grow, just as we've seen that grow in the DeFi ecosystem. Can you share more about this? What do you mean by the financialization of some of these NFT assets? You see as if people will be able to acquire these NFTs, get exposure to some of the underlying assets in this Web3 ecosystem. Can you share more with our audience what exactly you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you imagine an individual NFT, maybe... Uh, if you take like a, a recent trend, that could be something like a music NFT. And some of those music NFTs have royalty streams that are attached to them so that every time it's purchased, that uh, individual creator gets some sort of, of revenue. Some NFTs actually give IP rights. And uh, this isn't something new. Like we've seen kind of this financialization of, of music. You know, David Bowie did it uh, decades ago with his Bowie bonds where he sold the rights to his music in exchange for cash up front. And so... 
you're going to continue to see applications where uh, whether it's the artists themselves or whether it's funds uh, or other individuals want to take some sort of asset that they own and find a way to either generate cash flows or take a loan out of it or uh, just generate some sort of uh, liquidity in some way. The, the kind of ironic uh, aspect about NFTs is first it's non-fungible and then you find uh, the quickest way to make it as fungible as possible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's, it's non-fungibility that actually gives the fungibility attributes afterwards, right? I mean, it's in, in many regards, it's like uh, people that try to you know, tokenize assets and other types of instruments. But, uh, but you know, like it's very interesting because obviously we discussed this in other episodes of the podcast, but... You know, when people are trying to look at this ecosystem, it's a good example you mentioned before about Sand or Mana, some of these tokens of some of these ecosystems, or they can go buy directly the virtual land, right? So there's big, there's, or they play in the infrastructure layer and other consumer facing angles to get exposure to it as well. How do you see that? I mean, what's your view on some of these, um, let's say, the metaverse or Web3 ecosystems that are being built? You know, Sandbox is a very good example, you know, the central land to take to some of two of the most common ones. What's your view on that? Do you think? Uh, the hype around them are justified or you think it's still a lot of the we're very, very early days and there'll be others who will come with other sh additional and maybe potentially better features? Yeah, I think that we're definitely in the, the early days of finding the, the best model to experiment. Uh, and by the best model, I mean, like, what is the best way to combine a token, NFT, some sort of consumer application? And so if you look at the virtual worlds, the sandboxes, the central land, Somnium spaces, there was over $500 million in secondary sales in 2021. And sandbox, I think had maybe 350 million of that. And then if you, if you even like parse that even further, 281 million came in just the last quarter of 2021 alone. And so we've seen this enormous growth in terms of uh, individuals wanting to own and speculate on this type of digital land. Um, and then also like there's obviously the token that is involved. There's uh, a bunch of other types of NFTs that are in these ecosystems as well that might be more akin to something that you'd see in Fortnite. So that could be like a, you know, clothing or uh, a, a digital like skin as they're called. Yeah. So obviously no, there's been a lot of activity. It's been quite a, quite a remarkable to see on that, on that front. You know, one thing uh, Mason often think about and, and I still don't have the answer to it, but of course we talk about the metaverse, we talk about Web3 ecosystems, but sometimes the reality is there will be certain challenges that we dealt in traditional world uh, by centralized uh, means. For example, let's say if there's an IP violation, if tomorrow morning I take a certain brand and I go create some assets for them in the, in the metaverse in a decentralized ecosystem, uh, what, how are we going to do with theft? You know, I'm able to come and you know, I, I steal some assets in a Web3 ecosystem. Uh, you know, think about the uh, taxes. You know, I think whether we like it or not, some of these assets, you know, at one point the tax authorities uh, will catch up and we want to tax these assets. How, like, when you look at the you know, the future of Web3. How do you see us dealing with some of these challenges via similar centralized mediums or you think we'll, we'll have decentralized options to deal and get to similar outcomes? Yeah, so I, I can't really speak to the regulatory perspective, the tax perspective, but I think that the, the IP component is really interesting. And so if you think about uh, any sort of game, so like Sandbox is, is a perfect example, they want to integrate existing IP, whether it's from Disney or Marvel or, or whoever into their game, but those companies want some sort of assurance that their, uh, their IP isn't gonna be ripped off or used in a way that they don't approve of. And so a lot, there's kind of been two different dichotomies. One is uh, kind of create your own native IP, that way anyone can use it in any way uh, that they want. And that could be something, um, you know, leveraging existing IP, whether it's a board ape or crypto punk and bringing that kind of into the virtual uh, worlds that exist, or the model that the Sandbox has taken is interesting from the perspective they've heavily gone out and tried to license IP, integrate it into their digital world. And so they've partnered with Atari and a bunch of other brands like The Walking Dead to build these experiences that are going to uh, be more akin to what a user might experience in Fortnite. I don't know if I, I fully answered your, your last question on, you know, digital land, is it like kind of where is it going? And here's where it kind of gets interesting is because with that IP rights, the sandbox is able to assign individual plots to these individual brands, build games, experiences, whereas uh, that might be more challenging in other types of maybe more decentralized virtual worlds. And then as far as like the virtual land itself as a instrument, it, the, there's similarities and differences between land in the metaverse and land in the physical world. And one of the, the things I kind of come back to most 
is can we generate the same network effects in digital lands? Because if you think of the network effect of an apartment in New York uh, City, well, you have the financial district, you have friends, family, you have stadiums uh, that host millions of people for games. And uh, are you able to recreate that same experience in a virtual context when you can kind of just you know, move from one side of the map to the other side of the map fairly easily by uh, creating these kind of sinks, whether it's like this one individual game in a specific location, maybe you can. And so it's going to be a really interesting trend to watch over time. This podcast is brought to you by Bullish. Bullish is a powerful new exchange for digital assets that offers deep liquidity, automated market making and state of the art security. Follow Bullish on Twitter or visit bullish.com to learn more. Please note that digital assets and cryptocurrencies are high risk products. Consult your professional advisor before dealing in them. Bullish's services are available in select locations only and not to U.S. persons. Visit Bullish.com for important information and risk warnings. So when you look at some of, let's say, these metaverse ecosystems, you know, when we look at, let's say, at some pieces of land, for example, I mean, to what extent do you think location, location, location matters? Or because of the unique features of some of these metaverse communities, you think it can have a lower importance when it comes to that kind of ecosystem building and the value that is being derived for that asset of land as well. Yeah, so Masari actually just did a, a, an analysis that uh, will come out uh, in a couple of weeks on the sandbox and specifically its uh, virtual world in, in regards to its land. And so we were able to analyze which plots have essentially had the most uh, aggregate transaction volume. And what we noticed is that uh, most of those plots are either adjacent to some sort of uh, experience that uh, someone might believe is going to be valuable or close to another high profile brand within that uh, space. And so, uh, for example, like one of the most traded plots was right next to the Yield Guild Games uh, land that is owned by that specific uh, gaming guild. Yeah, very interesting. And also, I think you, you mentioned uh, a point I think is very, very important. You know, ironically, a lot of people want, want to talk, want to get involved in these metaverse ecosystems because it is decentralized. But ironically, what gives the value to some of these ecosystems is because some of these big brands are coming in. But in order for these big brands to come in, you need some kind of centralized entity that is negotiating with them, bringing them in, marketing to them, a bit like what Sandbox does in the Sandbox ecosystem. So do you think actually the ideal metaverse ecosystem will be one that is fully decentralized or will be one where there is some centralized players still playing a role in order to kind of increase the value and make the whole ecosystem more valuable? That That's kind of the, the, the trillion dollar question, if it were. And I think that there are merits to both types of, of uh, call it frameworks with every taking kind of a step back, every like virtual world is probably going to have some sort of, of KYC or like whitelisting for assets. Cause you don't want someone to be able to mint any specific asset a million times. Like you want a level of control. Uh, other types of uh, metaverse applications or consumer applications might not need that, that level of permissioning. And so they can be more, uh, decentralized just from the context of anyone being able to use or integrate uh, that service or protocol into another application. Yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting to watch. Also, you know, I think one of the challenges we, that we discussed at the start of the, of the show, right, was uh, the user experience, right? You know, what do you expect? Let's say when you're looking at, let's say, two, three years down the line, what do you think will be the catalyst to change this user experience that we have today? It's still quite clunky. You know, like I always joke that my mom, as much as she loves and she wants to learn about crypto, I think she'll have a lot of difficulty going, downloading a MetaMask, using it and going into a, an environment as like the central land or a sandbox. What do you think will, will, will need to happen for this to change? Yeah, more broadly, I think that the... The concept of the metaverse is going to be an incredibly long evolution. And so uh, my personal opinion is that before we get to this uh, hyper social 3D environment that people are interacting in, it's going to be very 2D first. And like the initial steps are something like verifying your NFT on Twitter and integrating those existing kind of property rights into our 2D worlds that, that we already live in. From a user experience, I think that uh, it's gotten much better if you look at say, uh, you know, the Coinbase user experience versus like the Wells Fargo user experience. Uh, and that just kind of has to continue to where wallet management to uh, all the all the technical aspects are abstracted away from the user on the back end. Yeah, exactly. So you're, you're basically they're using it without knowing that they're using it, right? A bit like the internet today, we're using it without knowing what protocols we're in and how we're, how we're plugged into it, right? Yeah. And 
And I think like one more point on that is if you look at that from a Web3 infrastructure side, most people don't want to run their own server. Most people don't want to run their own infrastructure. And so the the kind of near to medium term future that I think we're approaching is you have all of these uh, decentralized protocols and services that anyone can utilize. Anyone can be a part of those networks. And then they get aggregated by some middleman. Uh, but that middleman compared to like AWS isn't able to do the same type of fee extraction uh, or kind of consumer pressuring that they would be able to because it's still open source on the back end. You know, you know, what do you think is the impact of some of the large centralized players entering the space? I mean, one of the reasons we saw this rise of interest on the metaverse is when uh, Facebook changed its name to, to Meta in Q4 of last year. And obviously, and that really drove a rise of interest in the topic. When you look at, say, down a couple of years in your, in your let's say, magic visionary tunnel, you know, what do you think is going to happen? You think these, these centralized players, like, like Meta, who are trying to enter the space, are they going to succeed or really they'll be kind of the, uh, uh, there'll be more success and development and interest uh, on some of these decentralized platforms? That's a great question. I would love to say that the interest is going to go towards some of the decentralized platforms, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. Because if you think about from the context of where someone wants to, you know, interact, it's on the existing social networks. Like those have massive moats. Uh, I love Twitter and I can't, uh, I, of all the existing like competitors uh, that are kind of like decentralized, like there's not one yet that I've been like, you know what, I want to double down and use that. And so what I think I'm more optimistic about is finding ways to uh, integrate these, uh, you know, whether it's like NFT protocols or permissionless protocols uh, so that they can be used at first the existing social networks that we have. And then maybe after that, it will be easier to kind of port uh, that information to another type of platform. Interesting. And actually, before I want to talk about social tokens, but before we do that, like uh, one more question on NFTs. You know, the, there's obviously a lot of interest about NFTs right now, but there's also a lot of criticism. Uh, for example, when it comes to NFTs, that it's controlled really by a group of people that are basically inflating prices, wash trading, you know, just basically artificially uh, kind of creating uh, demand and, and moving prices on, on the assets. But also, there's also a lot of money laundering taking place using NFTs. By the way, not dissimilar in, to the art world, for example. Example, but the, the ease of being able to kind of me selling you NFT at a one et, and then obviously you, you know you believe that it's worth a hundred et, and obviously putting a price to it, you know it really can create a lot of financial issues. What's your view on that? Do you think there's um, the the NFT ecosystem is being democratized in a way, or is still a lot of uh, shady activity taking place behind the scenes? You know. I think that for the most part, it's a concentrated ecosystem from the people who are making money. So Chainalysis came out with a report uh, maybe a couple months ago, and it basically showed that you know there, there's kind of an 80-20 of bottom 20% of NFT traders are making 80% of the profits. And uh, I don't necessarily think that that's wash trading because there are disincentives to do that on platforms like OpenSea where you're paying a fee if there's a royalty for an existing NFT project, you're paying another fee. And so it's really hard to make that number work if you're trying to, to wash trade between different parties. As far as uh, the overall growth, I think that, and, and for, for context, I don't think that's dissimilar to some of those existing markets. The art market is a sport of the wealthy. You typically don't have uh, you know people of, of more modest backgrounds participating in that market. And so that's not really different uh, from the context. I think what, what has changed is the artists are able to benefit more than they were in the, in the previous paradigm. And uh, kind of like the one last point is that at the end of the day, all of these transactions are on a blockchain and there are companies that are getting really, really good like Chainalysis at connecting individuals. And at some point, uh, you know, we're not at the point where you can just go take all that capital and continue to circulate it and buy a house uh, in crypto. And so if you have to go KYC to Coinbase or some other exchange, uh, it, it becomes really, really challenging to exit without someone knowing what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, very, very interesting. I think it's going to be very one area to, to follow closely. There'll be God knows how many uh, research reports and discussions on the topic of uh, potential criminal activities and nefarious activities with NFTs and frankly, in the broader uh, Web3 ecosystem. I want to switch quickly before we're almost getting at the end of the show now on social tokens, uh, which I find, by the way, is one of the most interesting developments in my next book. I have almost a chapter on social tokens. But could you explain to our, for our listeners today what are social tokens? Or what do you think their impact could be? And also, how are they different from uh, non-fungible tokens, NFTs? Yeah, absolutely. So I've kind of defined social tokens as fungible tokens that are used to represent an individual, community, 
or uh, an underlying platform of other social tokens. And so kind of like briefly going through all those, you might have an individual who launches their own social token and they're able to send that uh, to individuals that they say, hey, like, thanks for supporting me. Or uh, there's kind of different models in terms of how you create value with a social token in terms of either creating a sync, so you have to hold 100 tokens to get access to this membership, or you have to pay for this membership and you get some sort of royalty on the back end uh, for each transaction. Going to like the kind of community token, you've seen uh, a few different models. Some of the more successful have been Friends with Benefits, which uh, requires you to hold tokens to enter a gated community online. And they're building other products as well that uh, are trying to uh, use the token in, in some capacity. And then kind of on the, the flip side is using this for sports. So Chili's uh, exchange, Socios.com, has done a really phenomenal job at reaching out to existing uh, soccer or uh, football clubs and partnering with them to issue a token that is going to kind of just increase fan engagement, whether they get to select uh, seats, get VIP access to players. And uh, that's just like kind of a, akin to airline miles. Like how can you incentivize engagement and activity uh, via this asset that you're able to issue. And then the last might be the the platforms. That could just be something like Rally. Yeah, from all these, let's say, uh, platforms you're seeing, or, you know, the, from the broader, let's say, social token ecosystem, when you when you think about two, three years down the line, where do you think that we'll see the most activity? Will it be in sports plat- sports ecosystems, platforms? Where do you think you'll see the most activity when it comes to uh, social tokens? That's a good question. I, I think that the most activity to date has been from... Uh, individual community. So for example, like Constitution DAO, where a bunch of random strangers on the internet came together to buy the Constitution, a funding for some type of activity, I think has been a, a pretty dominant use case that we've seen. Sports clubs make a, a ton of sense. Um, and when you start to get into the the use cases of these tokens, it, it, it gets interesting. To your point on like how are NFTs uh, different than social tokens, well, both are used for very similar purposes. Uh, the predominant to date being like gated membership. Exactly. It's always like a very good private club incentive of people coming in, right? And uh, you give, you, you, you get something in exchange, but you're also able to give as well, which is uh, very awesome from that perspective. Mason, we're already at the end of the show, but my bell is back. Uh, my bell is with me. I want to do a quick fire round of questions. Uh, so I, I, what I need from you is like one or two word answers on some of these questions I'm going to ask you in the rapid fire mode. Are you ready? All right, let's go. Let's do it. Here we go. So Mason, if you were not in crypto, what other industry would you want to be in? That's a good question. Um, I think that one of the most fascinating jobs is getting to watch early stage companies uh, and emerging technologies. And so I would say the venture industry. Venture industry. Here we go. What advice you were, you know, you were once upon a time, a young analyst at a crypto company. What advice would you give to other young analysts today in the broader who are now just entered or about to enter the crypto industry? Yeah, I have a whole blog post on this on Masari, but the short answer is writing and learning in public has been the biggest benefit to my career. There you go. What do you do on your weekends when you're not working on crypto? I love to read. Uh, I love to kind of just explore, hang out with friends. Uh, I don't have any uh, any hobbies besides coffee drinking, so uh, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Where you go? Like, actually, from a coffee perspective, here you go. What's what's your go-to coffee? Uh, I love cold brew. I'm a I'm a cold brew aficionado for sure. There we go. Uh, Mason, you lived in Asia for some time. What's your favorite thing to do in Asia? Oh, that's a great question. Honestly, the food. I, I don't think you can beat uh, Hong Kong dim sum. Uh, yeah, it, that's that's top. <laughs> yeah, it was my weekend uh, activity as well with a copy of The Economist. I love those dim sum weekends. Uh, uh, Mason, what's your favorite Netflix series or YouTube series or one you know show you recommend people always watch on any topic? So, I mean, what I've been watching uh, most recently, like everyone else in the world, is Yellowstone. There we go. Yellowstone. Here we go. Last question, Mason. Uh, thank you for being with us today. If you could have lunch with one person dead or alive, lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, who would that be? I would say Morgan Housel. He's probably one of my favorite authors and I would uh, just love to chat with him because he seems like a pretty amazing person. And here you go. I love it. And I probably have a cold brew with him as well. So here we go. Mason, great. Thanks for being with us. So how can people find you if they want to follow your content, your blog? Like, how, where can people find you? Yeah, you can find me at Mason Nystrom on Twitter uh, and you can find everything I write on Masari.io. 
Beautiful. Well, guys, thank you very much for joining us today. And again, if you like the show, please make sure to click to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. Uh, it really helps us with uh, discoverability and having more people uh, discover the show. If you want to stay on top of the latest developments on crypto and the future of money, uh, make sure to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter, especially for my weekly crypto capsule show, where I summarize the developments you need to know in less than 60 seconds. There's also my weekly newsletter, The Future of Money, that comes out every weekend. And of course, uh, make sure to also check out my YouTube channel. Uh, now my YouTube channels are all available in English, French, Spanish, Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese as well, where I have a lot of the previous interviews, like the one with Mason today will be on as well, uh, but also a lot of educational content as well. And last but not least, if you want to learn more about crypto or you have a friend and you want to gift them uh, more uh, educational content on crypto, make sure to check out my latest course on Udemy, uh, and where I summarize in 90 minutes, an hour and a half, the time it's shorter than a Netflix video, uh, it's called the Introduction to Bitcoin and Crypto Assets, um, really where I cover all the essentials you need to know from Bitcoin, Ethereum, Stable coins, DeFi, CBDCs, Web3, Metaverse, and many, many other topics. So thank you again for joining us today on this epi episode of the Future Money Podcast. And see you all next time. Bye.